Well, hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of the Exceptional Experience, an ECAC podcast. I'm your host, Billy Pickens, and one of them, and I'm also joined by my good friend, Maya Warren. Maya, how are you today? I am good, Billy. Glad to be back for another episode. That's right. Um, And before we begin, we uh, want to remind you that this podcast is brought to you by ECAC, the Exceptional Children's Assistance Center, where we empower families and improve lives. And we're grateful to them for allowing us to uh, do this podcast. And I also want to give a shout out to all of those who uh, viewed our podcast last time and uh, not to stroke our own ego here, Maya, but apparently we uh, we did pretty well. Um, so much so they want us to come back for a second episode. So I, I want to thank everyone. We couldn't have done it without you all. And I want to thank everyone who has viewed our podcast and shared it with those you love. Continue doing that. And also, I want to thank our new viewers, those who are just joining us. And we hope we, hope we can give you some great content that you continue to watch, continue to share, and most importantly, we hope that you leave with a positive message that can really help you throughout your day. So with that being said, we're going to now go into our main topic of the day. And last time we talked a lot about self-care and self-love, um, but we thought we'd build on that, no pun intended, by mm-hmm. talking about the importance of building relationships with not just with ourselves, but with others, and how my and I have navigated that as young people with disabilities. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important, Billy. Um, Yeah, I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah, same here. Um, So I'm going to start with a a, maybe a loaded question, but um, my how how, what do you value in your relationships? So when it comes to friendships, when it comes to family, when it comes to just people, what do what do you, what do you value in a good relationship? Um, I I I value time. Um, Amen. my love language is quality time, so I value the time that I spend with people. Um, that I have a relationship with it with um, no matter what type of relationship with. So, whether it be my friends, I value spending time with them. Uh, putting in effort, you know, creating things for them or helping or assisting. Uh, And conversely, I value when they spend time with me and, and, you know, serve, Uh, you know, I'm learning to receive help in that regard, but I'm also learning to value uh, when others are willing to help and learn about me and my various conditions and just me in general. That's such, I completely agree with you. I I also, and I'm not just saying this, I also value time. Mm-hmm. Um, time time spent is also my love language. I and and not to offend any of my friends who have bought me material gifts <laughs> because I love material gifts. But um, I'll be honest, I got a lot of material gifts that I've never touched. I've said thank you, and, and they've gone to the closet. <laughs> but I really value people's time, and I really value them uh, putting that energy into me. And I also value honesty and vulnerability. Um, I value someone who's honest and I value someone who keeps it real with me, you know, it, and I value people that are, you know, willing to, to help me and willing to guide me, but also, you know, I understand also holding me accountable as well. And I respect that about the, the friendships and relationships that I have as, and I also, I really, uh, you know, value just, um, you know, just trust and and loyalty as well Mm -hmm. Um, and understanding, especially as a person with disabilities, sometimes I feel like it is hard to know if that person's in your life just because they're trying to be nice or they're trying to be sympathetic Mm -hmm. and or they're really in your life because they genuinely appreciate what you bring to the table. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really value those friends who really are loyal and really are understanding. And, you know, even with my challenges, and you know my own struggles in life, they don't judge me for it. Um, but they they're always willing to grow with me, and they're always willing to help me through things, and always willing to be by my side and make me feel included in whatever they're doing or in their circle. And so yeah. I'm, those those are things I very much value. That's awesome. 
um, in kind of preparation for today's, you know, episode, I, so in college, I studied kinesiology. Um, and one of the things I learned about in terms of program design, um, cause that was one of my specialties in terms of my degree. Uh, there's a theory called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and with this theory, it's a pyramid that kind of simulates our most basic needs um, and then our kind of tertiary and quaternary, quaternary uh, needs in terms of importance. So as humans, at the base level, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have physiological needs. Uh, and those, you know, are simple as air. We need air to breathe. We need water to drink, stay hydrated. We need food for energy. We need uh, a safe environment or shelter. We need sleep, you know, clothing. And, you know, we need to reproduce all of those things. And um, then after that, we have safety needs, um, which consists of, you know, personal security, uh, employment, uh, you know, a sense of Um, being able to contribute to society, then you have love and belonging. And this is the third level of the pyramid right in the middle. And it, it speaks to how we are wired as human beings. And then especially as individuals with disabilities, because um, not only as humans, do we need to feel like we belong in terms of friendship and intimacy and family and connection but then you involve disability. Well, only about 20% of our American population has a disability. It Mm. makes us the largest minority, but also people with disabilities are the largest minority that is vastly misunderstood, especially for all of its nuance and complexity. So then you bring in some of the issues that are raised by being in this category, people not necessarily knowing how to communicate and talk to you, um, people not knowing how to accommodate or seeing it a need, disability issues in and of themselves becoming an afterthought. So all of those things impact us, you know, as people with disabilities on right. a personal level, um, which is why genuine connection and friendships and mentorships and just relationships in general are so vital um, to, you know, who we are as individuals. Right. And and to your point, I think that there have been kind of a moment of vulnerability here. There have been times that I think one of the ways that, I mean, I, as much as I love spending time with, you know, of course I hang out with you and, and all of our youth advisory team and people with disabilities. I think that when I was younger, there was a part of me that was very much like, I, I don't want to feel segregated. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't want to feel like I'm always hanging out with someone also someone who's also blind or someone who's also, you know, has who also has hearing loss or someone who has autism. Not not that I didn't want to hang out with them. Right. But I didn't want to feel like I was segregating myself. And so I actually would make a very conscious effort to go out of my way to try to hang out with the mainstream crowd, to try to you know, be at the cold party. I mean, in a way, as much as I don't like the idea of it to try to fit in, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, and, and granted, I was never, you know, like a bad kid or I never did th- got in any trouble or anything like that. But I think that sometimes I would stoop to lower places sometimes mm-hmm. to feel accepted. And, yeah. you know, I didn't realize that, I mean, they're in their life would are also misunderstood as well. And there's some value to spending time with those people with disabilities. And I think that's one thing that I come to realize and embrace my friendships for what they are. And I, I do believe that there will always be, for every 10 people that, you know, misunderstand you, there will always be one person that does. Like, I'm thankful for the sighted friends that I have that mm-hmm. do understand me and that are willing to help because if they they are there. Mm-hmm. You know, and maybe it's, it's sometimes it's hard for them because they have lives their own. But I appreciate when they do make time and they do say, hey, you know, don't feel alone, feel included. You're you're, you're part of the circle. You're part of us. And I'm yeah. for that. I think that's why well, I wasn't interrupting. I was just agreeing with you. But I think okay. that that's really beautiful. Um, and it raises two things. Like when we look at society and the way it's structured, 
there's there's like three main categories when it comes to disabilities people with disabilities and like mainstream interaction there's se segregation um uh, which there are laws against that you can't be out here segregating people with disabilities that's illegal yeah don't do that y'all <laughs> <laughs> then there's like the next step which is integration so you may be in like a mainstream setting but integration just means a, a small community or group of people with disabilities kind of sequestered to themselves within the framework of that main street um, arena. And then my favorite one is inclusion because inclusion means everybody disability or not are intermingled and there's a give and take of knowledge and experiences uh, on the mainstream side, they're learning to accommodate or they already have the resources to accommodate and on the disability aspect, there's the ability to kind of have that genuine interaction. Like while schools for the blind and specialty schools are needed in many cases, I also right. believe that there should be no shame for those who decide to, you know, attend, you know, mainstream school settings because right. if, if one thing I've kind of pulled around and asked my friends with disabilities who were in a mainstream setting, we all agree that, we gained so much from those experiences, being able to interact with people, understand social cues, um, being able to self-advocate on a different um, type of level, being able to articulate our needs and figure those things out. So there's a lot of value to that. Um, it's kind of like your introductory course to what life is going to be like, because uh, <laughs> it's yeah. not like we can stay hidden from, you know, society. You know, we we have right. to eat and provide for ourselves in, in whatever capacity that we can. So when we're yeah. talking about building relationships, it's very important that, you know, we do have some semblance of interaction with people without disabilities because they need us. Right. <laughs> they need our knowledge. They need our gifts. They need our perspectives because we see things that they don't see. And a lot of times that can fill in gaps and raise awareness for things that really matter. Yeah. And, and, and one quick point, I, I, I swear you really, you really bring the points out of me. Like <laughs> you say stuff, it's like bring some random stuff that I didn't think about, but one quick point before we move on to the next uh, part, mm -hmm. um, you know, to your point about the school for the blind and versus the mainstream, I'm, I'm, you know, I commend anyone, who did, you know, I don't, I, I don't argue with people who felt like going to the school for the blind was right for them, you know, right. it worked out for them. I don't argue with people that feel, but I know from my own personal experience, I'm grateful for the balance that I had. Like I, I was mm -hmm. in mainstream classes, um, my entire school career, but I also did go to Governor Moorhead School for the Blind here in North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, where Maya and I actually met at the Savvy program. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I had a healthy balance of meeting those who, you know, understood me, looked like me. And I also had a healthy balance of uh, th those in the mainstream classroom. So to me personally, and I'm, I'm not again, I'm not telling anyone what to do here. You know, you do you. But for me personally, that was that I couldn't have had a better setup than to have that uh, both mainstream and school for the blind balance. And it really helped, you know, me become who I am and it really helped me grow and evolve. Um, but anyway, so my, my next question is, um, so how has having a disability either positively or negatively affected your ability to build relationships um, and maintain your relationships in life? Yeah, so um, in the early stages, you know, it, it was it was an experience. I'll say that it was, it was an experience of one before I could really build genuine relationships with other people. I had to gain some semblance of, you know, kind of like what we talked about last time, self-love and an understanding of my conditions. Um, just because if, if you don't know what you have and if you don't know about your condition, it kind of puts you in a position to be, at the mercy of people who will tell you what you have, whether they're wrong or right. Um, and I did not like that. I wanted to have the knowledge base to be able to kind of articulate 
what I needed and to educate others. Um, right. So in the early stages, I dealt with a lot of bitterness because for those who, you know, whether you're listening or watching, I live with a condition called uh, oculocutaneous albinism and it's cogenital, meaning you can only get it from birth. Um, at no point after that, can you have albinism? Um, and so it means I have a no pigmentation in my eyes, hair and skin, but I am an African-American woman. So as a result of that, you know, it's about one in 20,000 individuals in the United States have this condition. So it's quite rare, even though, you know, you see quite a few people with albinism. And as a result of that, I, you know, I didn't have someone I could look to and be like, oh, wow, I can be comfortable in my own skin. Uh, and because I dealt with racism from my own community, then um, colorism from my own community, then colorism and other issues outside of um the African-American community, I dealt with a lot of identity issues um, right. to the point where I was self-loathing. Like I just did not like the way I looked. I would wear dark clothes, um, anything I could do to basically hide um, because, you know, no one told me like, oh, you're no one had was pouring into me to kind of help me build a healthy self-concept. So once I, you know, was able to kind of get a knowledge base of what I had, what my condition affected, and then, you know, the culmination of therapy and my faith, because that plays a huge role in who I yeah. am, all of those things contributed to me being able to love having albinism, advocating for albinism, and my adjacent vision impairment, um, which culminates into who I am today, advocating for others uh, and teaching people how to advocate for themselves. Um, so it definitely impacted me a lot. Now I'm very, you know, um, upfront and straightforward about my conditions. Like I self-disclose when I feel the need to, and I have no problem talking about them. And, you know, while this is a journey, I'm very glad that I've come as far as I have to where I can talk about it and, and hopefully, you know, shed some perspective on it for others. Yeah, I, that's, that's a great, I love that. I love, you know, what you shared there about not always being able to disclose and not uh, loving yourself and at a certain times in your life. And I think for me personally, it was never an issue of disclosure. Um, I was very open about my disability. I shared it with people. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm totally blind with progressive hearing loss from a rare genetic condition called noise disease, which affects the retina of the eyes and the inner ear cells. Um, it can also have other effects too, but for me, that's uh, what it affected. And then it, the uh, males are the inheritors and the females are carriers. So my mom was a carrier and I also had a lot of support growing up because both my grandparents were blind and my grandfather had noise. So um, I, and I also have two blind cousins because they had two daughters as well. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful that I had a lot of support growing up and it wasn't hard for me to share my disability because of uh, what I did see from other people. But I did think the difficulty came in naturally um, I think I think for well a couple of things I think one there was you know, always some confusion because even though you're comfortable with who you are sometimes it's hard to know if anyone else is um, and I think that was one of my biggest struggles is um, even though people generally liked me I could tell people you know liked my personality and liked who I was I was able to compensate for it but at the same time. It was hard to like I think we were talking before we you know got on the air about how um sometimes it was a struggle to get invited to things where it was a struggle to feel uh, included because sometimes I felt like maybe people felt a need to babysit me or a need to treat me differently um because they just didn't know they just didn't understand and and me one of my biggest struggles and me my biggest blessings is that I'm a people pleaser. And I don't like being a burden on other people. 
you know, so there was definitely times when I was like caught in between. I want to be more upfront and I want to advocate and I want to say, hey, can I come to uh, your gathering that you're having this weekend or can I do this? But at the same time, I don't want them to feel like, oh, either I just have to invite him because he has disability. And I don't want to, you know, be mean or if, you know, they just can just don't feel right about it. Um, but I think that the the older I've gotten, like you might, I think that I've become more comfortable with myself. And because I've become more comfortable with myself, I've really been able to project that comfort on other people. And I think they've seen the confidence in me. And I think that was another struggle with my confidence is that I struggle with anxiety as well. So there was a period where I didn't really go to social gatherings. I didn't really you know, want to ask that girl out on a date. I didn't really want to do certain things because it just made me too anxious. And and I, I'm still working on that even now. Um, you know, some of the ways that my talked about the same ways for me, therapy, my faith, meditation. Um, but it, it's definitely a work in progress. Um, but I'm very much working on that. But I'm thankful and I'm proud of how far I've come and been a, being, being able to do that and being able to um, be comfortable enough with myself. And also, then today I've learned that if, if that person doesn't want to hang out with me, if they're not cool with me or they don't, if they feel like I'm a burden, then good. Let them be upfront about it because that's one less person I have to worry about. And I feel like I have enough people in my circle that do care about me and that do generally want to hang out with me, you know, to where any anything else doesn't, you know, doesn't really matter. I mean, I wish those people all the best. I send them love and healing energy, and I mean that. But I, I can love them from a distance. And I can I, I think it's best to put the energy into the relationships that really matter. And that's one thing that I've really been focusing on and doing more of lately. And being less worried about uh, what does this person think of me or is this person going to like that I uh, want to do this? And, and really advocating, going back to that word advocacy, really advocating for myself and what I need from other people. Yeah, those are all great points. And you've been asking some great questions. I just want to chime in a little bit. Um, so as an advocate, I have a couple of theories that I've kind of coined for you know the communities I serve. And two of those are relational proximity and relational equity. Relational proximity is basically a theory that says you build relationships by leaning, listening, learning, listening, learning, and loving. So it's not something that is instantaneous. You know, it's not microwave, uh, microwavable. Um, it's more of a crockpot type of situation where you spend time building trust with someone especially right. in this context, someone with disabilities, and that opens doors for them to either self-disclose or trust you enough to, you know, talk about some of the things related to their disability. And then relational equity says you build that over time. So don't, don't ever feel like someone with a disability and is obligated to educate you. <laughs> right. They're not obligated. It's to their benefit to educate whomever they need to educate but it is not their responsibility to, you know, be, I guess, the brunt of all of your questions, yeah. even though you're trying to learn. Like at some point you have to take it upon yourself to listen and respond appropriately. So I mentioned those two theories because when I run into people who don't know how to even start building relationships with people who have a disability or a chronic illness, one of the main things I get is I don't know what to say which is usually followed by, I'm scared of saying the wrong thing. So since right. we've been talking about building relationships, my question for you, Billy, is to those people who are afraid to get it wrong when they're interacting with you or anyone else, what mm -hmm. are some tips that you have for them to kind of break the ice and begin to build a genuine relationship with that person? Well, I, I want to start by saying, and again, this kind of goes back to, my personal experience or my personal opinion about it. I personally, I personally don't mind uh, people asking questions. I really don't. I don't mind people. I'd rather you ask a question and not know. And I mean, 
there's really power in the words I don't know. Like I love I I know that we live in a society that talks about you know that really pr praises knowledge and knowledge is great. I love knowledge. I love learning new things and gaining new uh, opinions about things and really understanding. But there's a lot and some of the best ways to learn are through not knowing certain things. And so I, with that knowledge, I'm very much okay with people that come up to me say, uh, and say, how do you get here? How do you do this? And like you said, Maya, we're not obligated. We don't have, we don't have to educate anyone, but it don't be afraid to ask. If you want to know something, I'm going to tell you, because for one, that's kind of what I do. I'm an advocate. And two, I, I would rather that that's a great way to build relationships. And I would rather you, you ask me than just pretend like, like, you know, or not, you know, not say anything or just be ignorant basically. So um, that's one thing I will say is, is it's okay to ask. Don't be afraid to ask. Um, I agree. I, <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, I remember when, when this funny moment when I was, cause I was interning at the Levine's children's hospital a couple of years ago. And one of the kids, he used to love, uh, one of the patients there loved playing with my my cane and some of my devices. And, and everybody was like, oh, you know, you can't, can't, don't do that. His parents were like, don't do that, don't do that. And I was like, no, let him do it. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to let him do anything that would, you know, cause any sort of destruction or anything like that. But I was cool with that. I very much wanted him to do that. Like, the fact that he was a kid and he was doing that, I think says a lot about his curiosity. And I think curiosity is a beautiful thing. Um, and so I very much encourage that from people. And also see me as a human. Before you see a disability, see a person. I have a lot of the same interests as other people. I love music. I love entertainment. I love TV. I love pop culture. I love a lot. Of, I, I'm, and the thing is, I'm very diverse. I'm always willing. I love to learn about new things that I can invest in. I'm always asking people, uh, what, what, what's the new hot podcast people are listening to? What's the new hot album or song we're listening to right now? Because I, I want to grow my knowledge on things, especially things that I care about, that I'm passionate about. And so even if you don't have anything to say to me about my disability, that's fine. Or you know that, but treat me as a human. Just ask me any, any question you would ask any other friend you would meet. What do you like to do on the weekend? Where do you like to go? I find beauty in those relationships because I know that those people seem genuine and they seem like they care more about me than, oh, this, you know, this is just a blind guy and let's pity him. And we're... no, I, 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 I'm, I'm also a human that I have a lot of the same hobbies and the same ways of thinking and the same ways of talking that anyone else does. So I think if you can't go as far as, the, you know, talk about disability, just see me as a human. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those points on that note. Um, it's been really great talking with, with you guys and just, you know, us hashing it out about the subject of building relationships. But before we go, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Billy, uh, as we sign off. Well, thank you. And, and, um, lastly, thank you for UCAC. Thank you for, th thank them for allowing us to have this platform to do this podcast. Remember you can contact them at any time. You can, we have our parent educators who are willing to help parents who have children with disabilities. And also me, being the youth outreach coordinator, I'm willing to help any youth that uh, might be in need of anything when it comes to school or life or anything to that of that nature. Because life is hard, and especially for a person with disability, it can be pretty hard. So, um, but it, it's, I, I'd rather say challenging. It's, it's challenging, but we can overcome our challenges. Um, and so I'm thankful to them. And I'm also thankful, as I said, for all the viewers. Shout out to all those who have viewed the podcast. And shout out to all of our new viewers and continue to watch, continue to share. And I uh, hope that we left you with something that can uh, be used positively and, and can be a positive impact in your life. So with that said, um, re remember to glow and shine. Remember, remember to be kind. And from Maya... Billy Pickens, and the rest of us here at ECAC, we will see you next time.